and become a scientist, I'll eat my hat. That's what my parents were repeatedly told by my science teachers at parents' evening. But why did they say that? And how come I ended up as an engineer? I know I always asked why a lot when I was a child, but I don't actually think that's any different to any other child. We all continually ask that question, why? Which is a fundamental question to any scientist. That's why I'm a firm believer we are all born scientists. Whether or not we choose to study and develop our scientific knowledge is up to us. But luckily for me, I did listen to my science teachers and I went to university to study astrophysics. And throughout my studies and, and early career, I was still always asking this question, why, why things work? But then I realized I was always following that up with how, how things work. And to me, this became engineering. So the why is the scientist in me and the how is the engineer. Now, these days, I use my science and engineering to help solve one of the 14 world engineering grant challenges of the 21st century. I engineer the tools for scientific discovery, and I use radio waves to do this. And I'd like just to give some examples of, of how, um, in, in my field, we are using radio waves to engineer the tools for scientific discovery. But I'd like first just to talk a little bit about radio waves and the electromagnetic spectrum, because we all encounter parts of the electromagnetic spectrum constantly, for, in various forms. So uh, TV, radio waves, visible light, whether you're sitting at home, walking down the street, on a bus, in a taxi, you are bathing in a sea of electromagnetic waves, undulating streams of particles with no mass, called photons, that zips up invisibly in space through this, at the speed of light. Now, I'm using radio waves and um, the electromagnetic radiation, and I'm trying to tap into this radiation to have a significant impact on the way we farm, the way we fly, the way we design cities, and so much more. For example, 2.8 billion people in the world are still affected by water scarcity. And that number will only increase as the need to feed a growing population also increases. Um, there are several projects trying to implement subsoil sensing technologies in order to try and help farmers measure and monitor subsoil parameters, such as soil uh, moisture, temperature, and nutritional ingredients needed for crop growth. And so the, the project that I'm working on looks to implement subsoil sensing technology and radio frequency identification or RFID technology. So what you can see here is some nodes buried in the soil. So they're RFID nodes in the soil and they are taking the measurements of the soil parameters. And then we have a, an RFID reader on the tractor. Now, the nodes themselves don't contain a battery, so they're capable of harvesting this electromagnetic radiation from the reader on the tractor. So the nodes take the measurements and send that information wirelessly to the tractor. And that allows the farmer to determine what action to take based on those results. So we're trying to solve the problem of world food and water shortages by shifting towards this model of precision agriculture. Or consider jet engines. Aeroplanes are mission critical vehicles and as such we want them to be safe and efficient. And so during their development, engines such as this are instrumented with hundreds, sometimes even thousands of sensors. And these sensors currently are all hardwired to a data acquisition unit. And because they're hardwired, it means they're inflexible, they're very time consuming to set up, they're very costly, but also they're susceptible to cable and connector faults. So a wireless sensor network has been proposed as a, an alternative solution for these problems. So imagine an engine such as this, and inside that engine, there is a wireless sensor network, so a network full of these nodes. And imagine adding a node to that network was quick, simple, and low cost. 
the amount of information that we can build up of that engine now increases because we have more nodes in our network. And so we, the more information we have, the more likely we are to be able to design a much more efficient engine in the future, so thus reducing carbon emissions of the world. A third example is that of the built environment. Using wireless technology and radio waves to help the visually impaired navigate safely through buildings. Now, in the, need, in the response to the need to give the visually impaired equal access to public buildings, the use of Braille became a legal requirement in many countries, including the UK. So what we see are Braille signs affixed to many things in public buildings, such as toilets, lift panels, top and bottom of flights of stairs, in many buildings such as museums, cafes, and university buildings like this one. And for a visually impaired person, there is an inherent challenge here, and that is to actually physically locate the Braille sign in the first place in order to read the information via touch. And it's one that leaves a visually impaired person naturally frustrated. So we're trying to use radio frequency identification, RFID technology, in order to help with this problem. So what we have are radio frequency identification, RFID tags, embedded into each of the braille signs in a building. Now each of these tags have a unique identifier number, so that when the visually impaired user of the building enters the building, all of the information from the braille signs can be downloaded onto an app on their smartphone. So their smartphone is now capable of wirelessly interrogating all of those tags embedded in the Braille signs. So it means that that visually impaired person now has all of the information they need on their smartphone in order to navigate safely through the entire building. My final example of how I'm using uh, radio waves to, to engineer the tools for scientific discovery involve big scale instruments. Now, we've been broadcasting radio waves into deep space and listening to signals from deep space for over a century now. And that's allowed us to realize how much there is in the universe beyond what we think we know. And so over the past decades, larger and more powerful instruments have been designed to look deeper and deeper into space. And I've been very fortunate to have worked on, uh, as part of a very large international team, on building the next generation, the world's most powerful radio telescope ever. It's called the Square Kilometre Array, or the SKA. Now, the SKA will be made up of hundreds of thousands of antennas of different types, and here you can see uh, an artist's rendering of what it might look like. But all of these antennas will be connected and spread across thousands of kilometres but with a central core in Western Australia and in a remote area in South Africa. Now, the sheer size of the SKA will make it 50 times more sensitive than any other radio instrument. And that will allow us to answer key and ambitious questions in cosmology, astrophysics and fundamental physics. In fact, the SKA will be so sensitive, it would be able to detect an airport radar signal on a planet 10 light years away. And the amount of data the SK will generate is enormous. It's estimated that the dishes alone would generate more than 10 times the global internet traffic. Now, to me, these represent huge challenges in engineering and science and they are ones that probably aren't going to be solved in my lifetime. That's why I think it is the duty of every scientist and engineer to spend time inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers. And we all know the problems that we currently face in this country with the lack of qualified science teachers, but especially the lack of professional engineers. So I just want to take a minute to try and understand why this is. Why do we have a lack of professional engineers? Because I feel really lucky to work in a profession where I can look ahead and see the rising demand for my skill. 
Why do we have to work so hard to get the right level of talent, quality talent? How great would it be for young people to li be literally queuing up to join us? Not because they've been cajoled or pestered into thinking that it's the right thing to do, but because they know, they've always known about the great opportunities there are in engineering and science. Society, including children, has an understanding of what many professions do, such as medicine, because we've all had first-hand experience of it. And so it's ironic that engineering is everywhere, but it's invisible because it's woven into the very fabric of everyday life. Many young people simply do not know what engineers do. And why should they? if we're not out there helping them to understand and showing them how ingenious engineers are. And we all know that problem we face at the moment with the lack of women in engineering as well. And there is a lot of research into this, into the perceived barriers of, of getting more women into engineering, what the problem actually is, how ultimately we would resolve this problem, and what success would look like for more women in engineering. So what would success look like for me? Well, I'd like to be at my daughter's parents' evening and overhear teachers talking to parents and saying, if she doesn't become an engineer, I'll eat my hat. Thank you very much. <laughs>